But I have a lesson today that I think is relevant for all of us, but it's also a call. It's a call for spiritual leadership from our men, from our fathers, and from our young men and young boys that while one may be a, a leader and a father. Ephesians, the fifth chapter that Fred read from us, makes some interesting statements. I say interesting because I believe they're much deeper than oftentimes we look at them. We see in 25 that husbands are called or commanded, are given the role of being the heads of their wives, but they're told first in 25 to love your wife. Now, isn't it interesting that husbands are told to love their wives? Um, isn't that obvious? Isn't that a foregone conclusion? Would have I married Amanda if I didn't first love her? The answer to that, young folks, is yes. See, loving is something we learn to do. Love is something that we practice at and we acquire over time. Did I have emotions for Amanda when we got married? Absolutely. Did I desire to spend time and to be with Amanda when we got married? Absolutely. But that is the precise kind of love that the world grows in, falls in and out of throughout life. Because there are times that I don't have a strong feeling of affection for Amanda. <laughs> and times, <laughs> believe it or not, that she does have a strong feeling of affection for me. But Paul is describing the kind of love that he's calling husbands to have for their wives in this chapter. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now that's strong. Because Christ gave himself for the church. You know what oftentimes I believe that we think that means? Is that I am called to lay down my life for my wife, for Amanda. That means that if something terrible happens this morning, if if someone comes charging at Amanda with a knife, it is my obligation, Bob, to dive like secret service in front of her and take the stabbing for her. That's what we picture. This is saying to lay down our lives for our wives. But really, that's not what Christ was about, was it? Now, we know that Jesus died for his church. But he also lived for his church. You see, husbands are not called to lay down their death for their wives. But they're called to lay down their life for their wives. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she might be holy and without blemish. I don't know what it is about men, about males. But we've been shirking our responsibility from the very beginning. Isn't that what's got us into this entire mess? I made the joke Friday night around the campfires. I was presenting to the, the people that were over at Climber for the weekend camp. That women have a hard time deciding where they're going to eat. Because the last time they chose, they condemned, uh, condemned mankind. And we pick on Eve about partaking of that fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. But 
That's not where the blame lies, is it? Adam was to be a leader. And Adam shirked his responsibility. We have the same situation going on in our society and in our world today, that we as men are willing to shirk our responsibility. Let me suggest that one of the many ways that throughout history and maybe in your life today, maybe or maybe not, that we as men are able to shirk our responsibility is taking verses like this that speak of being head of our wives and our wives being submission to us to say, I'm in control here. Do as I say. I'm going to sit down here and you go and do as, as I tell you. Chris jokingly tells Brittany sometimes to know her role. <laughs> I get some a very evil glare. <laughs> and if he's not careful, it's going to get him worse one day. Right? That's not the kind of leadership. That's shirking leadership. And that's not the kind of leadership that we see called here. Because Christ laid down his life to, to build his church up. Now, I want to encourage all of us men today to give our lives to build our family up, to build our wives up. As leaders, we cannot expect our family to be more spiritually minded, to be more godly, to be more Christ-like than we ourselves are. Oh, it happens. I know many of you ladies are or have been the spiritual leaders of your house for quite some time. And I commend you in those efforts and in continuing to fight that battle. But men, we must rise to what we are called to do, to be leaders and to lead our family in spiritual uh, directions. If you would turn your Bibles to Second Peter, the first chapter, in verses five through eight, you're probably going to say, oh, "I'm very familiar with these." In fact, many of you may be able to quote uh, these passages. But I want to look at these in a different way today, because Peter's saying to the Christians he's writing to, and you and I. He says, and besides this, give all diligence to add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter is speaking on individual basis here, and he says, if you are diligent to add to your faith virtue, and to that virtuous faith knowledge, and he goes on through this entire list, and he's speaking on individual basis. But while it is equally true of the individual, it's also true of our family structure. That our families should be striving to add to our faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge, into knowledge, temperance, into temperance, patience, into patience, godliness, into godliness, brotherly kindness, into brotherly kindness, love. And the same is true of our churches. That our church ought to be adding, our congregation ought to be adding to our faith, virtue, into that virtue, knowledge, into that knowledge, temperance. And to that temperance, patience. And to that patience, brotherly kindness. And to that brotherly kindness, love. And I ask, where is the source of all these things? It comes from individuals, no doubt, doing what we are told to do. But God has not left his church, nor his family, his spiritual family, or the physical household without leadership. 
And any organization, any structure, whether that's an individual, whether it's a family, whether it's a congregation, whether it's a community, will not go where they are not led. And gentlemen, we are called to lead the way. We should set these examples in our families and in our church. The title for this morning, as I believe Fred announced, is Wanted, a Man. <laughs> Looking for a man, a good man. What kind of man? First off, if you turn your, high, he, your Bibles to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, as we look at verses 5 and 6, I will believe that we will see that we are looking for men, for a man of the house of faith. A man of faith like Enoch. Now, when we think about faith, oftentimes we are thinking about, well, that's what I believe, and, and I believe in God, and I believe that Jesus gave his life for me. But I asked the children on our way over to Climber last week, who was the oldest man who died before his father? And it's got her hand up. Now you probably know the oldest man in scripture is Methuselah, 969 years old. Raise your hand if you would, if you know who the oldest man that died before his father was. Levi's got one finger up. <laughs> Those in, in our in our uh, in our class or in our vehicle going over know it. Well, if you know who Methuselah's father is, that gets a little bit easier. Because Methuselah's father was a man by the name of Enoch. And Enoch we read about as well as in the Old Testament in Hebrews the 11th chapter and verses 5 and 6. And we read by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So in case you haven't quite kept, caught on yet, Methuselah, even though he was the oldest man of scripture, died before his father because his father was such a man of faith that he was translated by God that he might not see death. That is faith. Faith is not just something we believe, but it is something, as the sixth verse goes on to say, something that we believe that God not only is, but that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Enoch, we can assume by this passage, sought after God so much that he walked with God in a spiritual sense. And God recognized him and translated him that he might not see death. As fathers, as leaders of our families, and as leaders of the church, we, may we be men of faith like Enoch, that we are striving to become more like God each and every day, and that our lives strive or are showing to be such. A man of faith like Enoch. Secondly, though, if you have your marker, I asked you to turn to first, Second Peter, first chapter. You may want to put a marker there as we go through these. But we're to add to that faith virtue. And I would suggest that we want, that we need men or a man of virtue like Gideon. Gideon was a man of virtue. Now, we know a lot about Gideon. He was like so many of the leaders, and I touched on this in the end of our Bible study this morning. But leaders are not individuals who step forward and do what is easy. Leaders are not individuals who step forward and do what they are naturally good at. Leaders are individuals who strive, who work, and step forward to do what is needed. You see... 
To be a virtuous father is to understand that. To do a virtuous father is to do what's needed in our household. Because it's needed, not because it's easy for me. Not because I enjoy it to do it. And the same is true in our communities and in our churches. Because when God through an angel came to Gideon and he told Gideon, I'm going to deliver my people through you. Gideon says, whoa, not me. And so God convinces Gideon to go out and to get an army. And God says, oh, too big. <laughs> if they're fearful, tell them to go home. <laughs> Well, hold on, even those fearful men could help us. And I believe all the smart individuals went home that day. <laughs> and God looks and he says, still too many. And so tell them to go down and to get a drink. And all those who bend over to lap like a dog or to go home. And now Gideon is faced at doing what he's not comfortable to do with an army that's not sufficient to do what he is being called to do. And what's going to get Gideon through? Number one, it has to be faith. But we see that Gideon would not be a leader if he did not add to that faith virtue. And his heads of our household, his heads are leaders of the church and of the community. If we do not add to our faith virtue, we will not be able to accomplish what God has put before us. What is virtue? If you're with me in Judges, the seventh chapter, look in verses 16 through 20. Because we read there, and he divided the 300 men. Yes, that's all he had at this point. 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand and emptied pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. Verse 17, and he said unto them, look and do likewise look and do likewise I mentioned a couple of times in the last year my family's been doing some jump ropes I told both Evie and Christian that their stage of sports simple conditioning will make them an athlete a standout athlete and they both seen that to be true we are not as diligent about our jump rope as we ought to be my children aren't as diligent about doing jump ropes as they should be Christian won't do his thousand the other night I find out the next day he only did 500 he cut short you know how I found out the next day Chris he did 500 or let me rephrase this way. Can you guess why it took me so long to figure that out? Because I wasn't there with them. You know what? When I'm out there on that slab of cement doing jump rope with them, they're always there. Now, Tom, do you think I have any Bennett or I have any need of jump rope? It's very kind of you. But I can benefit from it. But they're going to be diligent about it if I follow. Man, it's a cop-out. Man, it's a great sadness and shortcoming when we tell our children and our grandchildren to do as I say and not as I do. What about Gideon? Oh, these 300 men. Where do generals typically stay? Way in the back. All right, gentlemen, told you what to do. Go ahead. Did you catch what Gideon said? Verse 17, look on me and do likewise. I'll be leading a fray. We need leaders in our homes, we need leaders in our churches. And we need leaders in our community that have the kind of virtue that we can say, look on me and do likewise. We need men of faith like Enoch, men of virtue like Gideon. 
And we need men of knowledge like Timothy. If you would, as I speak for a few moments, turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy, the third chapter, and we're going to look at verses 14 through 17. But we have so many things that rob us. And this isn't men, and none of these things are relevant solely to men. But I am calling for leadership in the household. We have so many things that rob us of knowledge. I don't think we always look at those things as robbers, as thieves of knowledge. But if you were to ask yourself, what is the greatest prohibitive factor in my life from having more biblical knowledge, more wisdom in my life, what is it? Young folks, if I can have your attention for a moment, I talked this morning as we talked yesterday about habits. There are things that form habits that are very useful, that are very good to have, that can help you accomplish things that generations before you never did. They're electronics. But they will rob you of many things in your life if you're not careful. What are we looking down at back there? It's not electronics, is it? Nope. Good. <laughs> they will rob you of things that are useful in your life. This isn't just children. Adults. The latest study I saw showed, look at their phones, 2,600 times a day. 2,600 times. Gentlemen, men used to have studies. What do you do in a study? Can you guess, Corey? Read and study, right? A, a study is like an office, right? My generation and younger at Playstations, Nintendos, and Electronics. I'm not speaking against releases. We all need downtime. But there is a reason that generations prior to my generations knew more scripture than we currently know. Now we can use these things to our benefit. We can use them to our good. I spend a lot of time in my vehicle. The amount of audiobooks that I'm able to listen to, the good information I get on YouTube is amazing. It's beneficial. I use it in daily life, in my daily walk. But as leaders, we must strive to add to our faith virtue and to that virtue, to that acting right, to act in such a way that I can say, look at me and do likewise. I must be add knowledge to it. Notice being diligent to add to the knowledge. That means that there's not a soul here that's accomplished it, but that we're building to it. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 14, 17, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be fully furnished or perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We need 
men of knowledge like Timothy. We need men of temperance or self-control like Paul. If you would turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verses 25. And it's interesting to me that self-control is at the core of so much of what we do and do not do. Temperance, self-discipline. It's interesting to me that I've tried to teach my children to do right by doing what's wrong so much throughout my life. I've been noticing it more. Would you quit? Going, going to this thing. I can't do it properly. Stop that. Just drop that <laughs> you kids quit being so nasty to each other. <laughs> Is that how you say it? You don't quit smacking each other, I'm going to come back here and smack you. I used to jokingly say to my children, Amanda, when Christian started kindergarten, she wasn't allowed to say it to them anymore. Nonviolence or I'll bust your head open. <laughs> it's a joke. But she said, What's going to happen when he goes to school and repeats that? Self control. We must have it in dealing with with life and our children included. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 25 and 27 says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. We need discipline in what we do, in discipline in our lives. How do we get that? I think the best way is by holding ourselves accountable. Gentlemen in particular, I think our ladies are probably better at this. But the one thing we hate to the point of refusing to do it is to say, I am wrong. GPS has helped us out so much. Because now, Brenda, you don't have to tell Mike, Mike, just stop and ask for directions. And Mike doesn't have to say 50 times, I'm all right, I'll find it. You two ever have that actual conversation? Oh, yep, yeah. okay. Mike doesn't respond, but Brenda is certain. Not like you have GPS now, right? The way we can develop self-control is by holding ourselves accountable. If I force myself to admit to wrong, to apologize for my mistakes, it will start to hit me ahead of time. Slow down. Act temperately. We, as heads of the household, as leaders of the families, leaders of the church, must have self-control or temperance in our life. Men of patience or steadfastness. You see, we have trouble um, with patience because it's so much like temperance. But the idea of patience here, steadfastness, continuing on, like Job. Job had some bad days, didn't he? It's amazing to me, chapter 1, verse 21, we see throughout all this, Job did not sin with his lips. In fact, verse 22 says, he says, God has given and God has taken away. Chapter 2, and verse 10, he admonishes his wife and he says, you speak as a foolish woman. And it goes on to say, and throughout this, Job did not sin with his lips. That's steadfastness. That is one of the themes of Job. That our circumstance doesn't matter. The answer's always the same. I trudge ahead. I push forward. I stay the course. 
In other words, faithfulness is the answer when things are going well. And faithfulness is the answer when things aren't going well. It's important for us to understand, to be reminded, and to ever be mindful that this life is difficult. Our life is going to be hard if we are a Christian. And we are going to have difficulties and struggles that are devastating. But this life is going to be difficult if we are not Christians. We are going to have difficulties and struggles that are devastating. But the difference is our final destination. There's some other differences as well. But if we stay the course, the conclusion of the story is much different. I find it of no coincidence that looking for a man of patience like Job would lead us so well into looking for a man of godliness like Joseph. Emma, I was, I was looking for Emma. She's at camp, isn't she? Emma's getting ready to head to school. Mac, I think, is probably with his family camping. But increasingly so, children, many of you, Christian, Naomi, and, and the rest of you as well, are getting to the point where you are unsupervised. And that increases throughout life. Your parents aren't standing there. I think about Joseph. You see, Joseph was doing what was right. He's just conveying godly messages, visions given to him by God and gone thrown into a well. How many times have you heard? How many times have you said or thought, what makes that difference? I've tried to do what's right doesn't pay off anyhow well we've all been there but when we're there what we sometimes forget is I may be trying to do what's right but I'm doing it for the wrong reason you see Joseph could have said that but I believe we see through Joseph's life that he was doing what was right not because he was going to get a payoff but because it was right because in chapter 39 of Genesis, Joseph finds himself away from his family, out of sight of his father, with no supervision. And Potiphar's wife advances on him and is aggressive. And Joseph is a man of godliness that says, I cannot do this against Potiphar who's employed me, I cannot do this against myself, and I cannot do this against God. You see, godliness was understanding that we are supervised at all times. Godliness, like Joseph. A man of brotherly kindness, like Stephen. Acts, the seventh chapter, Stephen has preached the word of God and they begin to stone him. Verse 59, and they stoned Stephen and he calling on God saying, Lord Jesus receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord lay not this sin to their charge. When he said this, he fell asleep. That's brotherly kindness. It's a proverb, and uh, I think Romans 12 is well deals with it, if I'm not mistaken, about doing well to those who persecute us. And in doing so, we will what? Do you recall? Heap coals of fire upon their head. You know what I thought that meant most of my life? I'll make them feel worse. That'll make them feel where oh, that'll just irritate them, and oftentimes it does. That's not Stephen's attitude, is it? Do what's right to really put it to them. We can't act like the world and expect them to be attracted to the way of Christ. 
I believe those coals of fire are referring to refining properties of fire. The same way you would purify gold or silver or any other precious metal. I had a lady who left our business one time who told Amanda, I can't, I just wish I could punch Mike in the face. <laughs> she was nasty. Amanda says she's not the only lady to feel that way. <laughs> I now shoe her horses. I have regular conversations with her. And she told me something that we don't oftentimes hear. She said, Mike, it's always bothered me. Always bothered me the way I left your place. And it always bothered me the way you reacted. It refined. It encouraged. It caused for a good outcome. We need to be people with affection, with brotherly kindness, like Stephen. A man of love, like John. If you turn your Bibles to 1 John, the third chapter... And we could start as early as verse 9 here, but we're going to come down to verse 11. And he says, John does, for this is a message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whatsoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know that love, we know no love. That he laid down his life for us that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brothers in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God love abide in him? Brother, and I believe that's a question the world asks of us. We make the statements all the time. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love the world. I care for the world. John saying, you're able to help and you don't how does the God love of God abide in you I believe on a daily basis the world asks that of that day in and day out does the love of God really abide in you can I see it is it evident verse 18 little children let us not love in word or talk but in deed and in truth, we must start by loving our family, by putting them first and doing what's right to give them, to supply for their needs. And we must extend that outward to our brothers, to fellow mankind as we go throughout our life. A man of love like John. And lastly, and most challengingly, a man of all graces like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not going to accomplish that. But I'm going to strive for it. And if I'm striving for it, my children are going to see it. My children are going to notice when I sit down in frustration and give up for a period of time. My wife is going to notice when I've momentarily given up the task. You will see it in my life, whether I do or I do not. And the world around me will see in my life whether I'm striving to be a man of faith like Gaina whether I'm striving to be a man of virtue like Gideon, 
whether I'm striving to be a man of knowledge like Timothy, whether I'm striving to be a man of temperance like Paul, whether I'm striving to be a man of patience like Job, whether I'm striving to be a man of brotherly kindness like Stephen, whether I'm striving to be a man of love like John, and whether I'm striving to be an individual of all graces like our Lord and Savior. If you've not accepted that challenge, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ's path, method, and way for your life, then why not change that this morning? Why not dedicate your life to him and make yourself susceptible, to make yourself open to the forgiveness, to the grace, to the blessings that he's made offered to you this morning? If you're subject to that gospel call, then please come forward as together we stand and sing.